right, so in this video, it's gonna be all about reverse shoulder replacement. I wanna to talk to you about what reverse shoulder replacement is, who I would indicate it for, how, um, how it works, and then how I specifically use technology in my practice to perfect the outcomes. So first, what is a reverse shoulder replacement? Let's look at these images and I think it will help. So what you're seeing here is three x-rays of a shoulder. One is of a normal shoulder, one is of an anatomic shoulder replacement, and one is of a reverse shoulder replacement. And what an anatomic shoulder replacement attempts to do is reproduce the anatomy as normally as possible. So you can see here, you have a humeral head, and what you can't see, but what's implied is there is a little piece of plastic here that serves to resurface the glenoid or the socket side, and I'll show that to you in a second. Over here, you've got the reverse shoulder replacement. And so what this has is you take the ball and you put it on the socket side here, and you take the socket and you put it on the ball side here, thus the term reverse. And this is for different indications, which we're gonna talk about in just a second. Here's another picture of those two types of replacements. Again, in this case, you can see the ball that has resurfaced the worn cartilage on the humeral head. And then you can also see the plastic or polyethylene, which resurfaces the socket. On this side, you can see, again, the ball, the socket on this side, and then in between, an important plastic liner. So who gets a shoulder replacement? Well, it depends on which one you're talking about. Are you talking about an anatomic or a reverse? If you're talking about an anatomic shoulder replacement, that's gonna be somebody who generally has just run-of-the-mill run osteoarthritis. The cartilage and the bone are gone and it's rubbing hard against each other and you've tried everything else the pain is severe and everything else all the indications are that this person needs to get this type of surgery you want to make sure though that the rotator cuff it is intact not torn nor is it at risk of tearing in near future so there are lots of patients who have arthritis but if they have a significant cuff tear you don't want to do an anatomic shoulder replacement and the reason is if you do that and then a tear develops that shoulder replacement will fail and you're gonna to have to convert it to a reverse later on. So you don't wanna waste that time and, and that surgery and undergo all that needlessly, right? So what about a reverse shoulder replacement? Well, there are a lot of indications, but generally speaking, there are three main indications. There's somebody who has an irreparable rotator cuff tear and you've tried everything else. Like I said, that's always implied that we have tried all the conservative measures. So you've tried everything else and they're still having pain and disability and you, you don't think their, shoulder, their rotator cuff is fixable either because of the size, their conicity, or the patient's age. See, this is important. As we age, the quality of our tissues, they worsen. Now, we, we all get that when we talk about glasses or gray hair or wrinkles, but that same phenomenon that's occurring outside of our body is occurring inside too, including to our muscles, our bones, and our tendons. And so as we age, we're more likely to get rotator cuff tears. And when those tears occur, they're less likely to be fixable as the decades progress. And so I have, I, if I have a big uh, rotator cuff tear in like a 70 year old patient, I'm rarely going to indicate surgery for that because I know that it doesn't matter what I do in surgery, the quality of the tendon is going to limit the repair. It's not going to heal down or if it's, if it, even if it starts in a good position, it oftentimes will rip through the stitches and that's something that's really difficult to control. In fact, I, I can't control it. You can try augmenting it, et cetera. That's just not my personal philosophy. And most surgeons are gonna move away from rotator cuff tears in that type of situation. So instead, we'll do something like a reverse shoulder replacement. So that's one indication. Another indication is somebody who's just had a bad fracture. Those are actually pretty technically difficult to do an anatomic shoulder replacement for. You can do it, but most people, and most surgeons, I should say, are gonna to move to reverse in that situation. The complication rate is much less and the results much better, generally speaking. And another incidence would be when you've got somebody who's got run-of-the-mill arthritis and an intact rotator cuff, but the deformity to the shoulder is so severe, you're worried about putting something on the glenoid that's anatomic because there's so much bone loss. A lot of times a reverse shoulder placement is going to be better in that situation. So what I have here are some x-rays that we're going to run through briefly. So here is a normal shoulder. You can see the humeral head here. You can see the socket here. And most importantly, you can see space. And that space is where cartilage lives. It lives on the end of the humerus and it lives on the end of the socket. And you can't see it on x-rays, but it takes up space on the x-ray so that you know it's present. 
compare that to this x-ray where there is no space because all of that cartilage is worn away. In addition, you see secondary signs of bone spurs, which form down here characteristically. The surface looks irregular and you see sclerosis here and here where the bone is more white because as the bone rubs on bone, it almost scars the bone more. And you can see that on the x-ray. Now here's a completely different x-ray. You can tell that this humeral head has gone upward, right? And so why did that happen? Well, if you go back here, what you didn't see is that there's a rotator cuff that sits here and helps hold that ball centered down in the socket. And when that's missing in a large enough amount and, to, uh, and, and long enough over time, the humerus migrates up and it rubs here and it rubs here and that leads to a different type of arthritis. In this case, it's not osteoarthritis. We call this rotator cuff arthropathy. Arthro means joint, pathology means problem. So it's a joint problem and in this case because the rotator cuff is deficient. Rotator cuff arthropathy. So how does a reverse shoulder replacement work? I'm gonna show you on this particular illustration. So here's the normal shoulder. And what you can see is they're showing that the rotator cuff muscles collectively, there are four of them, are pulling this way on the humeral head. And what that's doing is that's creating a stable fulcrum or rotational point around which this ball will rotate. And so they show it here. And so when you, when you activate your deltoid muscle, the shoulder rotates up and that's how you can lift your arm up. In this picture, we see something different. We see the humeral head has migrated up and it's rubbing on the undersurface of the acromion and it's causing damage, just like those x-rays I showed you. And so when the deltoid contracts here and pulls, because there is no stable fulcrum, all that happens is the humeral head just rises up and grinds more right here. And that, that's what leads to pseudo paralysis. Pseudo meaning it's not true paralysis, but it sure looks like it. The patient feels like they have no strength and they can't lift their arm up in addition to just pain. Now, there are some people who have this type of x-ray that I showed you earlier who can still lift their arm up. And that just has to do with how your muscles have acclimated. But oftentimes it does lead to this condition of pseudo paralysis. Again, so how does a reverse shoulder replacement work? Well, what it does is it creates a stable fulcrum and it allows you to use the muscles that you have left in a different way. So remember before, when you contracted your deltoid here, what would happen if you didn't have a rotator cuff intact is this humerus would just rise up and articulate with the acromion up top. But now because you have a stable fulcrum or rotation point, when the deltoid contracts, the arm rises up. And so now this muscle is able to be used for overhead activities. And that's the essence of it. So every surgeon is gonna approach surgery differently. And in my case, what I like to do is I like to use computer modeling before surgery so that I can actually do the surgery in the virtual world first and then use that same plan in surgery. It just gives me a higher level of accuracy and reproducibility than I could do. And I, with, if technology is available, I'm gonna use it, I don't mind. I'll cheat every day if it makes me better and gives my patients better results, which in my hands it does. So let me explain that a little bit to you. So here is a cross-sectional CT scan of a shoulder blade. So what you see here is you see the humeral head and you see the shoulder blade. And all I wanna point out here is how thin the shoulder blade gets. So you only have this area of bone to try to grab onto and get good fixation for the socket or the glenoid side. And as it wears away, that becomes more and more of an issue. And so it's really important that you have your screws centered correctly in the right place because if you're over here, over here, you're gonna get a very thin layer of bone and you're not gonna have good fixation. You're gonna to wanna to maximize it and get that screw as far as you can right down the center. And that's hard to do because at the time of surgery, you don't see all of this. It's all covered by muscles and tissues. All you see is this face right here. 
and you don't know where everything is behind it. It's very difficult to know that at the time of surgery. And this is where computer modeling and doing the surgery beforehand, I think makes a big difference. So what I'm gonna demonstrate for you here is how I actually do the planning in short form. I'm gonna run through it very quickly for my reverse shoulder replacements. And for every single patient, I actually record myself doing it and I just talk through it so the patient can see what I'm doing for their particular case and then I'll give them access to that video so they can watch it if they want to. So here's one of my patients uh, that I'm doing a reverse shoulder replacement for. So you can see cross-sectional views here on the left and the three-dimensional view here on the right. And one of the things that I notice on this particular patient is that they have some proximal migration or the humeral head is risen up like I was showing you before. And what that tells me is, is that this patient does have a large rotator cuff tear and that's why I'm doing a reverse shoulder replacement. So here's a planning screen and what it shows is a three-dimensional view here uh, in the middle. On the upper right, you've got the top view and then uh, the bottom right, you've got uh, the front view. And those are the blueprint views where you can see the implant is actually shown in that aqua blue color superimposed on top of the CT scan. And initially you can see the screw on that top right view is not in the right place. We need to get that centered. We can also tell on the three-dimensional view that there's a gap over here, and that's gonna to have to be addressed. And so we're gonna run through and make some adjustments. So so the first thing I did was I added a wedge here, and you can see that wedge is designed to fit more, even, more closely the normal angle of the socket. And I'm, I'm just rotating into position so that it perfectly fits it. And the idea here is, is that we get good fixation, but we don't have to cut away a lot of bone. It's more customized for this patient. And now I'm just moving it up a little bit. I'm just trying to perfect this implant so that it's in good position in the final construct. I'm looking at it three-dimensionally here. I can see that screw is maybe a little bit towards the back. We'll see if I change that in a second as I look at the cross sections in the upper right. So I'm moving it down and seating it, seating it a little bit better. I made a couple more changes there. And I'm just trying to perfect this implant position. So I still need to get the screw down the center. So I'm gonna rotate a little bit. Now you can see that screw actually is getting into better bone. And I'm changing the length until I get fixation with the threads all the way out. I don't mind if it's a little bit prominent, but I don't want it too prominent. And you can see it sticking out there on the side. Now I'm looking at it from the bottom. I can view this thing from any direction I want, which is incredibly helpful because again, I'm not gonna get to see all this bone at the time of surgery. So here's the humeral side, and this is not as important because I'll perfect this at the time of surgery. I don't use any special guides here, but I can get an idea of my initial size. Don't get too caught up on the exact position here because that's actually decided in surgery and it's not as critical to have this planned, except for maybe, if you will, just the size. But even that um, is gonna depend somewhat on just how we feel about the thickness, etc. That said, I'm kind of making some ad gross adjustments to get it aligned. Now in this video, you can see the, the sh shoulder joint going through a range of motion. It's a test range of motion to make sure it's not gonna hit the bone anywhere. And you can see here in the bottom right, just the blueprint in the upper right, the blueprint version of this where the metal is well positioned. We like our final construct and we're ready to move on to our final guide. Okay, so what you're seeing here is the end of the socket and I picked four points and I pushed generate guide and now this is gonna create a model for a guide that will actually be built three-dimensionally in real life and we'll be able to use to set on top of the glenoid and we'll be able to use that little hole there to drive a pin through it and everything else will be based off of that. And so I go in here and I confirm that I like the scan and then I say generate it or, or save the report and send it and I'm gonna get a socket and I'm gonna get a guide that corresponds to that socket that is specific for this particular patient. I try to do this two or three weeks beforehand so that we have enough time to generate this. We're gonna send that report to the company. They're gonna three-dimensionally print that and then I'll have that available at the day of surgery. We'll sterilize it because it's metal, you can sterilize that and I'll actually use it in surgery. Here's an example of what that looks like right here. So you've got the socket, You've got the guide and you see these little imprints where the feet are supposed to sit. And then when you put it on here, get this right. 
Oops, there it is. It fits perfectly. And what I'll be able to do is in surgery, I can actually hold this up to the patient. I'm looking at their socket. I'm holding their socket up. I put the guide on this surrogate and then I put it in the shoulder. I hold it in place and I drive a pin straight down that hole and everything else is guided off of that. So that now I've set the, the top, bottom, front, back, and the angle. And I can use that plan to just trim a little bone because I use a, a reamer that is hollow and goes right over the top of that wire that we put. And everything is based off of that. And so the level of precision, my comfort with taking a oftentimes very difficult case and making it much easier is so high with this particular system. And the, le the results are so re reproducible. If you want to get an idea of what patients can experience after or a surgery, including the recovery, what they experienced before, and, and what their final result is in terms of being able to range their arm overhead, I've made at least three videos on that. And you can just watch those and, and hear anecdotal experience from different patients and what they have encountered. I'll tell you in general that these surgeries, they take me about 45 to 50 minutes People go home the same day, you're in a sling for four weeks, and then you start range of motion after that. They generally say, if they've had a rotator cuff repair in the past, that this surgery is phenomenally easier, less pain, faster recovery than a rotator cuff repair. And I would say that is true for the vast majority of patients. So hopefully that answers most of your questions about a shoulder replacement, and in particular, a reverse shoulder replacement. What it is, who it's for, how it works, and how I use technology to help improve my outcomes and make difficult cases easy. Thanks for watching.